to you in memory and storage on your system. I'm going to talk a little bit about Hub. I've used these a great deal in the past. There's a little bit of controversy over using them anymore. Um, but I still would suggest that you consider getting these in your portfolio of tools that you have available to you because in many cases it can be hard to get injected into the network. Um, and is everybody relatively familiar around the differences between hubs and switches? That's not a topic necessarily we need to talk about at all. Um, you can get 10 meg or 100 meg versions of this still. You need to do some testing on these though if you're buying something off the shelf because there's a lot of vendors that are selling something with a label of a hub and it's really a switch. So you end up getting this thing and it's not, not necessarily what you want it to be. Um, the one, one that I've used in the past that I like is the older Netgear, the EM104 devices. This is on a metal case, they're hard, so you can lug them around in your bag and they can take a beating. Um, but it's an easy way for you to be able to insert yourself into, uh, into a network to be able to look at traffic. And we don't have a board to write on, do we? You might want to do that. I think so. So other options here are um, you can use USB NICs um, in addition to the network interfaces that are on your machine. And there's actually some nice advantages to that because you can isolate those or go in and configure those NICs to not include a lot of other things on them if you want. Because the network adapters you're going to use for this are strictly going to be inbound eavesdropping on traffic, right? So you don't need to participate in Windows networking or anything else that you've got going on your machine. So you can unbundle those. The other thing that's an advantage of these is there may be situations if you're close enough to a piece of hardware that you're trying to look at an issue with and you need to try to tap on either side of that, um, you can do that with, with two USB NICs as well. <coughs> um, I would suggest if you can, if time is important in the traces that you're taking, by using the same adapters like that, you get the same level of latency through them than if you're mixing and matching those on the machine. So keep that in, in mind also. Wireless tracing, I, I'm not going to delve into much of this tonight, but I at least wanted to talk about it a little bit. Specialized adapters for this in order to make that happen. Uh, our general wireless adapters on our machines are not promiscuous by nature to be able to pick up traffic, but you can spend some coin on these. You drop into several hundred dollars being able to, to get an adapter to, to do that work. And then duplex considerations. Um, again, depending on where you're taking traces. So if you're going to sit down with an end user, a client that's having an issue, and you can take their network adapter and in inject yourself with a hub, jump into that space and be able to sit right there with them to take traffic. Um, you can obviously break the duplex component of that by using a hub and being able to do that injection. Um, the other option though would be insert taps within your network where you can get the bi-directional traffic um, combined to be able to get it into the interface of your network card. Because again, you're only getting data that's coming in over the receive channel of your adapter. So you've got to be able to combine the bi-directional traffic associated with this in order to be able to capture that. Again, there's some dollars associated with getting those taps. Those are not cheap. Um, and in the case of high performance networks with us, we're, we spend a decent amount on those. Rough idea, Chris, on what gigamons are running us today. Um, a few thousand? Yeah, a few thousand. Yeah. Right yeah. So as we get back to, to talking about hopping into the network, um, these aren't always the best, isn't always the best choice to have available, right? You can actually set the trace up itself on the host or on the <coughs> server. Um, but sometimes you can have a difficulty being able to get this set up. You may need administrative privileges to be able to get that done. Uh, you may have performance impacts on the system itself that you're trying to run that on. But sometimes that can be the only choice you have. We talked a little bit about tapping the host or server, whether you're using a hub in order to hub into that environment to be able to get the traffic out or being able to leverage the existing taps that you already have in, in your network. 
We talked a little bit about maybe needing more than one trace point. So you may need to be on either side of a piece of equipment that you're trying to do troubleshooting on. Uh, the other scenario that you're going to run into this with is um, just diverse environments, right? You may end up with a client that's four hops away from where the server is on the back end. And you may need to move yourself as you start working through a problem and taking traces to different parts in the network in order to, uh, to capture what you're looking for. So again, with some of the TAP technologies you have today, you can aggregate that traffic in multi-tier environments to be able to get traffic from two separate segments of the network to be able to combine that data to look at it. That could occur through two different NICs that you have on your machine or through some kind of an aggregation point. Switches are the other item you can leverage. Um, although this and Chris, you can keep me honest with this too. This has become tougher over time, I think, than where we've been in years past. Um, at the time I was doing this work, we had a close enough relationship with our networking group and the audience was small enough that they trusted us to be able to walk into switches, step into the configuration and then actually mirror traffic off from a port. Um, if you're not careful with what you're doing with that, you can really screw your network up. So there was a level of trust that was gained there in order to be able to do this. Um, generally, it requires uh, kind of read-write authority in your switch in order to be able to accomplish this. And whether you're sending an SNMP command into the switch to be able to do that or you're walking through the console to be able to do that. We've also received feedback from switch vendors in the past few years that they don't even want us running taps or uh, port mirrors inside the core of our network. They're too concerned about the performance impacts of doing that. So that's making this a little bit harder than I think where we've been, where I was at in past years doing this work. That also has, has lent itself to us being able to utilize other technologies within our network to be able to accomplish this. So I talked a little bit about the NetScout probes that we have here. Um, for example, when you look between our core network where we do layer three routing today and where our layer two switching is for our servers, all that fiber in between there we have tapped. And we can take advantage of being able to get traces right out of the probes by doing that. So I don't have to step in and do a port span or a mirror or figure any of that out. We've, we've got that visibility in there already. <coughs> the other thing to consider here too is traffic behavior in the environment. And man, I'm gonna run way over while I speed <laughs> this up. Uh, traffic behavior in the environment is having some assessment of what you're actually tracing within. Because you can walk into environments where you may just have standard stuff it's kind of point-to-point uh, -point traffic. You may have a little broadcast noise that takes place that gets sent through all of the ports on the switch. Or you may be working in an environment where you have something like a service bus. And some of those applications literally run in broadcast mode. Um, so you can end up with a lot of traffic showing up on ports that um, you know, you're not even sure you should be seeing or getting. So you need to keep that in mind or think about it, that as you step in to grab traces. And, and once you get started at least capturing some traffic off the network, you obviously can be able to determine these things and try to do some filtering to get that traffic out. Asymmetric paths. This one can be a real challenge. Um, so multiple tiers in a network, right? We talked about this a little bit in, in what our core looks like today where we might have a couple dual layer three switches. And, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the OSI model coming out. But if you've got fiber that looks like this, right, the, this switching gear is gonna make its own decisions about which paths it thinks it needs to take through that network. And in many cases, it's gonna use basic algorithms like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to evaluate the MAC address on this device and, and based on the outcome of that evaluation, if it's even or odd, I'm going to choose this path or the other one. So you end up with 
ingress traffic come in on one path and egress traffic heading out another to go out through the network. Um, depending on where you're tracing in the network, you need to have some idea of what the lay of the land looks like for that as well because you may be hooking in some place in here to take a trace, only finding one side of the traffic for your trace when you're, when you're capturing it. For us, again, we were able to set up paths across these um, and tie them into the nest route devices that we have, and so that allows us to aggregate that traffic across those. Again, that's another item I don't have to think about if I'm going to uh, step into this environment to take that trace because I can just set filters up to what I need and I'm good to go. But you may run into these environments depending on, on where you're tracing. So this leads into what I'm talking about, right? Document the network that you have and the path that you're working in. You must map this stuff out. You've got to have some indication of what the lay of the land looks like or you could be hunting for hours on end trying to figure out how to get traces. So determine where you need to take the trace at. If you can stay as close to the host or the server as possible, the better you'll be. But you may have instances that occur uh, within your network that you've got to move around. So I can give you a good example of this one. Um, and again, it, it has some, some history with it, but we, uh, we had a consultant come in one time that um, had a dual home VPN on their system. And we didn't have any protections in place to validate our, uh, the routing protocols that we were running internally, whether it was an uh, authorized source or not. And this person dropped in on the network, picked up all of the route traffic out of their organization, and we're talking like a big three firm here, and flooded that into our network. And we started propagating all of those routes across our routers. Flooded route tables, now think about trying to find this machine, right? We, we had an idea, we could tell by looking at the routers we had this issue going on, but how the heck do you figure out where the source of this is coming from? So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through some of the frame headers. I'll give you an idea of how we went about trying to tackle that one. This is another one that can be a challenge. Can you replicate this problem every single time when you're taking a trace? Or is it just a scenario where it's intermittent? You know, sometimes a person's calling you and saying, oh, it's happening again. Or you're sitting down with them and they can walk through this over and over and show you what, what it's doing. A big difference in how you can go about troubleshooting these issues. Um, I'll mention here, I think I've got another point in the slide later on, but one of the techniques though that I've used really successfully over the years with this is uh, especially in the case where the problems can't be, are, uh, are inconsistent on when they occur, is to put an icon on their desktop with a known target that, that you know is not related to the, the issue that you're dealing with at all and have them click that. So at the time they're sitting on an hourglass on their screen, realizing I'm in this issue or this state again, click that icon because what you can do is initiate traffic at least through your trace that you can mark that, that trace someplace. Without your ability to be able to do that, and if you guys haven't had a chance to take many traces, again, as, as we step out of this tonight, get Wireshark, load it up, just run it for a while on your machine and take a look at what you see because you're gonna get thousands of packets. Um, and when you multiply that by things like servers on the back end where you're looking at where you may have 10 gig connections through there or you're running a gig, at least a gig worth of traffic into those environments, there's no way you'll sort yourself through that. So getting those markers in there will really, really be of benefit. Um, you don't necessarily have to have it all the way through. If you can identify it at least at the, at the client it'll give you a chance to be able to mark that traffic through other traces you take elsewhere. And I'll talk a little bit about that after I miss it, remind me when we get a little further in, into the traces. So with all of these products, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about traffic volume. You're gonna have to use filters when you're doing this work. Um, and there's two different types of filters generally with all these products. 
those that you use when you're capturing traffic off from the network and those that you use when you want to review the traffic afterwards, display filters. Um, if you're not 100% sure for what, with what you're looking at, just grab more wide open traces. Get as much data off from the wire as you can. Um, you can go back and try to sort that out with a display filter after the fact to get you down to a narrow, you know, a more narrow set of, of uh, traffic to look through. Save these because you will reuse them over and over again. Grab ones for ARP traffic, DNS, DHCP, common things that we know our systems are doing. If you're in an environment a lot where you've got SQL, any of those kinds of things, Microsoft protocols, you can grab those to be able to reuse them really easily. So understand what may the, be the best filter. Again, I talked about none, um, where you don't put any capture filters on at all. But again, be careful what you ask for here, because you may get a, a shitload of traffic coming through. Um, in some cases, you can overrun your system with the amount of, of tracing. I've, I've had several occasions where I've clicked the go button, and it's like, oh my god. <laughs> it's like bar, 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 bar. Um, the system was writing the disk as fast as it could. But you can walk through different levels of the protocol stack here to try to figure out what you may need to look at. Um, it's not always the case that you just want to grab something based on an IP address. Right, and we'll talk through a little bit about layer two, layer three traffic and how it moves, but you may need Mac level information on what that device is doing. How is ARP actually functioning on this thing? Is it really finding the router that it needs to in the network based on how that works? You can walk up through the stack, obviously, based on what the protocol may be. This one probably isn't as common anymore because we're really using TCP and UDP. But you might have some other protocols that are riding on top of that, custom app stuff that you might want to look at that you could uh, build a filter for that. Certain ports of services that run through uh, TCP, UDP. Or you may have a scenario where you look at a particular offset. And what I mean by that is that maybe there's a pattern of behavior or you know what the traffic should look like at a particular point in the data portion of the packet itself. So you're past the headers, you're up in that portion of the, of the frame, and, and you're looking at a particular offset into that where you're, where you're trying to uh, trigger yourself to collect data. Again, I talked a little bit about this. Think about the traffic you may need that isn't in the filter set that you have. So data volume. We've talked a little bit about this. Um, there's, there's some ways you can tackle this uh, through techniques called packet slicing. So, you know, Ethernet frames overall are 1,460 to 1,500 bytes in length. You may not need all the data pieces. If, if what you're trying to troubleshoot is getting data from one point in the network to another point in the network, regardless of what that data is, you can make a decision to cut that data off in, in the analyzer so that you're not tying up storage space for that. You can use something called a ring buffer. Has anybody used any of you used that before at all? So ring buffers, again, you can write out to disk. You can get an idea of how much traffic you're taking in and kind of decide I've got X amount of disk space I'm going to set aside for this or time meaning you can get an idea of what your influx of traffic is based on that filter, and maybe you can capture 10 hours worth of traffic. And if you get to that 10 hour mark, you're just gonna go back to the front of your traces and start overriding them again. It's a good way to be able to walk through, uh, walk through the data that you can keep without just keeping an analyzer running constantly. Triggers are another really um, good tool to use. This kind of goes back to the comment I made earlier about providing the end user with an icon to click on to be able to mark your traffic in the trace. But there's, there are other things you could do with this as well. So you can look for particular events in the network and set the analyzer up to be able to look for those. As soon as it sees them, it can start capturing. The other thing that the products will do is they'll also allow you to do a bit of a pre-buffer on some of this. So when that event occurs, 
it won't just start capturing from that point going forward. It will give you some traffic in front of when that trigger event also occurs. Those are really helpful. Trace markers we talked about. This is, is really critical. Um, you've got to have some basic understanding of what this model looks like. Um, and I, it sounds like the majority of you in the room have some familiar, familiarity with this. Um, but obviously, you know, traffic that's, there's very little, I would say anymore from a physical level, I think that I've dealt with, um, that used to be the case. I mean, when we were really working with shared media before, you know, you would deal with contention issues on an ethernet network that you had to sort through. But switching has changed a lot of that because that collision domain has been reduced dramatically, right? That, that domain on the ethernet network anymore sits in the back of the switch. It's not on the wire. Um, there's a lot of history around this too, right? <coughs> this, is, this is the reason when you look back you know, 30 and 40 years on these protocols, that's why our packet sizes are the size they are today. Because there were physical limitations on how, how long the wire could be and what the electrical magnet, magnetic propagation delays would be across that wire. And frame sizes had to be a particular size in order for that to work. So that, that's what drove the history with this. But very little with this anymore. Um, in many cases with physical issues today, you have other capabilities you can use in the network to try to troubleshoot those issues. Switches today, for example, will tell you if you have frame check sequence errors in packets. You don't necessarily need to have an analyzer to determine that any longer. Definitely data link, understanding, does everybody understand the basics of layer two traffic and MAC addresses moves traffic from NIC to NIC? Right, layer three is net to net. We're all we're all good with those fundamentals. So again, this is a depiction of the wrapping of traffic as it's going, you know, up and down through the stack. So parts of this we've talked about a little bit already. Having a fundamental understanding of routing versus switching. Um, there's a fair amount to understand on the switch front still. Um, there's a number of technologies that are, you know, in place that go along with this today. Everything from network access control to quality of service to, sorry, mom, I will call you later. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's that? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. I just I watched you not answer your call. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> spanning tree is another item that's you know still hanging around. I we still have elements of that in the network today, right? Pieces of it, yeah. So, but there's again, there's some capabilities, technologies around that you need to have some, some comfort and understanding with. Routing protocols can also be a benefit, you know, beyond just understanding the, the basics of, of traffic moving through the network. We talked about this a little bit already. Data link frame types. Is everybody in the loop that there's different types of frames? Is this familiar territory for everybody? Wooden one, metal one. Yeah. <laughs> there actually used to be two more than this. Can anybody tell me what they were? This is a real history lesson right here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not old enough to know this one. Novell Raw uh, was another one. The other one? Yeah, no, see, there was one with a snap header as well from years past. But those are history, right? Novell's all but dead. So these are really the two that are left. Um, another history lesson. Anybody know what the 802 of this means? 1980 in February. That's correct. That's yeah. when that's when the standard was published. Uh, Maybe you are going to write to me. 
that's when the working body for this paper was published for this. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk through a little bit of these frame types. And this was very political years past. Um, so we talked a little bit about broadcast domains. Again, I kind of understanding what you get in your trace because you may, you may not know what's getting broadcast on the wire. VLANing can sometimes Cognizant and challenges too, depending on where you take the trace, you may be seeing tags, but in a lot of cases, tags drift off on the last leg coming into the machine, so you may not see those. So some other things to think about there. Routing, IP addressing, address resolution, DHCP, DNS, all of these are pieces you gotta have some familiarity with as you look at, at, at how traffic is, is how conversation is getting initiated across the wire. Everybody in the loop on connection oriented versus connectionless protocols. We good with that. So here's the headers that we talked about a little bit before. Does anybody know what the DIX acronym stood for? I, I, this is how old I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dell I. Intel, X, Xerox. <laughs> they were the initial organizations that pulled, that pulled this together. Uh, working on that frame format. So there was just this ether type header that's in here. Right? Once you get past, there's a preamble that runs on the front end of this. So again, the, in ethernet networks, they're not deterministic. So there's no time division component to how this traffic gets on the wire, right? When you're ready to transmit, send it. So the network cards on the network have to have a way of syncing their clock up when those bits are coming in. Um, that's the preamble that's running on the front of this. The weird thing is the IEEE community actually adopted the exact same preamble, but they split it up and called it two different things. It was weird, the politics associated with some of this stuff. Once you get past the, the destination MAC address and the source MAC address, you run into this ether type header, um, which is telling you what the upper layer protocols are that you're going to be processing behind this in this variable data area here. I, there, a lot of this, I think, to some extent, was driven a bit by IBM at the time, because again, this is when there were wars between Token Ring and Ethernet, and IBM had a lot of history with SMA and some of the other protocols they ran during that time, but they wanted these other uh, link headers associated with, the, uh, with these frame types. The weird thing is, is they put, so the link field ended up, you know, taking the place of where the ether type started, and then they included these destination service access points and source access points. So these map to essentially the MAC addresses that's here. Um, there was some thought by the IEEE that these might be different, which is very bizarre, right? Because if you're going to send traffic into a system and you don't know what the application sitting above it is going to be, somehow there has to be an exchange between these systems to know what those numbers are to begin with. It, it was just, it was a weird approach to this. So these ended up Historically, if you look at any traffic that's running a uh, what's called a logical link control header on an IEEE ALU 2.3 frame, these will always be the same. They never change. To add insult to injury, there were some upper level applications up here above the stack that expected to see this ether type. Well, the ether type had been replaced by these service access point numbers. So there was incompatibility between this frame format and the one up above. So then they added the snap header on the tail end of it. The snap header is that ether type right there. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen, again, it's been a while since I've taken any traces, so I haven't been in touch with this for some time, but, but there were days when I was taking traces that if you had the host configured incorrectly, they just wouldn't talk. And they wouldn't talk because they had the wrong frame format. So most of the systems that I see today, Windows systems today, they're configured to automatically uh, accept either of these frame formats going forward. But it kind of is a, it's a historic base thing. At least you should have some 
some fundamental knowledge of. So we've talked a little bit about this, about network, app-to-app uh, -app communication taking place at the transport layer. We need to understand the basics of subnet mask as well. This, this is another really, really tough area. Um, you know, most of the folks that we work with outside of, especially in our practice, outside of security or, or the networking team itself, don't understand this in any way, shape, or form. So the goal, I would tell you, is to try to keep your network designed as simple as possible. If you're doing network tracing and coming into an environment, again, you may not, you, you, this gets back to the point of mapping this out, understanding the network you're taking traces on, what masking they're using in those environments. You have to understand that in order to be able to, to understand the environment you're operating in. Um, this is a really tough space though. So we, for the most part here at Consumers, we've used you know Class C masking for some time just because it made it easy for people to be able to interpret it. We've moved away that some, away from that some with some of the network we're doing, but it throws the support teams right off the ledge. They just they don't they don't have the capacity to get their arms around that to understand it. So again, keep that simple. And the dotted decimal notation that we use today, right, that's for us. The systems are always interpreting this at the bit level, and they're using masking to determine the difference between the network and the post portions of this. <coughs> Getting some feel for our understanding of gateways can also be helpful where you're sending traffic through at, at a layer four level and it's getting translated in some fashion to another system. Um, that, there's no silver bullet for this. I would just tell you it's on a case by case basis, but you may run into this from time to time, um, depending on the environment you're tracing in. So we talked a little bit about this already, about how MAC data is used, what its responsibility or movement of the traffic is in the network. Uh, role of DHCP, um, do many of you understand some of these parameters we're talking about get delivered by that protocol, right? You can statically configure these in the host or you may be getting them from there. That's why some of these protocols may be important for you to be able to take a trace on to understand what the environment is. DNS is another one that falls into that level. Caching can also get you here too where some hosts are automatically are picking something up and hanging on to it for some time period. And you may not see that in a trace, but it may still be a part of the environment that you have to deal with. So tracing the examples, I've got just a handful of stuff in here to walk through with me. We can get this wrapped up. Um, so there's some level of basic fingerprinting you can do just by looking at tracings. Have you guys had experience with this, with other tools that you've used, right? Certain OSs have particular patterns of behavior associated with them. Uh, time to live is one key indicator. The other one is the window size of the machine. Generally, these will always tell you whether this is a Unix box or, or a Windows machine. Um, what else could we talk about in here too? So we talked a little bit about, um, about uh, trace marking. So if someone is, is notifying you or again, clicking on an icon to mark a spot in a trace. As long as you've got that marker, even if you have traces in two different spots in your network, or if you've got a client here with multiple hops, and you're taking another trace back here on the server side someplace else, if you can get that marking right here, you can still find your way through these traces on this back side, even if you're tracing back here. Uh, one of the indicators you can use for that is that is this ID field right here. This will also give you an indication too, in some cases as to whether you, you're getting packets um, uh, duplicated in some fashion, or also if the same frames are just not showing up. Um, and sometimes that can be difficult to tell uh, depending on what the upper layer traffic is around that. That ID field can be really key um, to what you use for that. Again, other parts of the header, here's the upper layer protocol that would be used in, in the IP header. 
and talk a little bit about DipServe stuff uh, in a few minutes. Um, it's, do you guys have familiarity with window sizes and how those work at the TCP layer? Yes, no, maybe so, no? Okay, so again, UDP traffic is connectionless, right? It's a best effort method of delivering traffic to another system. So I'm gonna package up this information in a data frame I'm going to drop it into a UDP uh, packet and send it off. So typical stuff you would see, you know, in that case may be network management things that we would use today, like uh, SNMP is an example. Um, and again, there's no guaranteed delivery of service. If the if the packet gets whacked on its way there, the the application itself is going to have to have some other means of figuring out how to transmit that data again. It just won't be there. TCP is connection oriented. Um, we can take a quick look at some of this as well, but uh, what drives the connection oriented portion of this is both systems on either side will randomly select a sequence number that they use um, for uh, communicating back and forth. And those sequence numbers um, increment based on the amount of data that gets moved back and forth between these systems. And again, you can tell whether you have duplication of traffic if those sequence numbers get repeated. And this could be some traffic we could look at in future, future times to get together. Um, but generally, in a normal communication, you would want to see those sequence numbers just continue to increment on either side based on the amount of data traffic that's moving through those. When the traffic arrives at any either of these machines, um, there are buffers in the system to be able to hold that data. And that is the window sizes that you'll see referred to here. Um, these can get exhausted if the system is really running slow. As you look through a trace, you'll see this number going down as frames are showing up. You, this can get all the way to the point where you have a, what's called a zero window in which the system is just sending back to the other side. I've got no memory space left to accept anything else that you're sending. And I'll give you one example of a case where that's actually used in a positive way with an application we have here today. Um, Windows also has added, in later years, they have added scaling options for this also because this field is only so many bytes, bits in size, and systems have advanced, again, beyond the design of these protocols over the years, and so there's a multiplying factor that can be used for these as well. So you can actually mm -hmm. send more data than what you can advertise through the TCP header itself. So retransmissions with that, also zero window sizes with that are typical things that you would see with that. Um, I did a little bit of an explosion here on the, on the frame. Um, just to talk about the different fields that are in here. Um, differentiated services is quality of service or what's referred to as dipsert co code points. Um, so again, this is a bit sequence where um, various combinations of how these are uh, crafted can determine how intermediate hops in the network prioritize that traffic. So in most cases, you know, years back, when traffic showed up into a router, for example, that's routing traffic, it was first in, first out. It just get, would get queued up and go. Um, you have the option with a lot of devices today and switching gear today to be able to set up multiple buffers in those systems based on the QoS you want to run. And when the traffic comes in, it gets evaluated and placed into those queues, and some queues are prioritized over others. Um, that's where you'll find this information coded in those frames. So again, this is intermediate hop to intermediate hop as the data is going through the network. Um, fragmentation is another item. And you'll see this in TCP traffic. Um, when a session gets negotiated back and forth between two systems, in addition to that window size being advertised, basically saying, I have this much buffer space, I have this much buffer space, 
They also exchange what's called an MSS value that's in the header of the phrase. And what that has to do with is as you run through multiple hops in the network, you may traverse other parts of the network that can't transmit the same frame sizes as what you, you may have on this end as being an Ethernet interface. So classic historic example of that is in the past when, the, when wide area networks ran ATM, they had 53 byte cell sizes. So you would take a 1500 byte packet that you were running from here and that packet would have to get carved up into much smaller sections to be able to traverse those networks and then get pulled back together again when it got to the other side of the network. You have options within these headers to be able to say this traffic cannot be fragmented. So what would happen if that shows up at a, in an intermediate hop where fragmentation is required, that's going to get rejected. And you're probably going to see some form of an ICMP packet that's coming back from that device basically saying, I can't fragment this traffic. So those could be other conditions or errors that you might run into. Um, how are we doing on time? Are you guys okay? Or you want me to zip it? So we talked a little bit earlier about, um, um, about the rogue device that plugged in and was doing all of the, the route advertisement was on a, a network. So this TPL um, can be an identifier for the type of OS that you're running, but really the purpose of this, what this is used for, is as a device goes across route hops within a network, that gets decremented every time. And you can also get to a point where that number gets to zero. As soon as it gets to zero, the next routing device it touches, it's going to throw it away. So if you do end up with loops in your network or you end up with frames that are just wrapping around and around and around, this will keep that from getting crazy. Eventually, these will hit zero and stop. I used this technique in that particular problem with that client that plugged into the network. And uh, one of the other guys that works here, Ed Sickmiller, brilliant guy, love working with him. Ed worked on this in this issue. And uh, it took us several hours, but we ended up finding that machine. And how we found it was we started grabbing traces in different parts of the network, and we started looking at the TPLs. So we were determining how many hops that had gone through based on wherever I could grab a trace in the network. And so if I knew it had been six hops, four hops here, three hops here, we started collecting that data. And then Ed, again, we talk, I talked about scripting earlier. Ed ended up pulling some scripts together on, uh, on one of the Unix platforms we had. We pumped this data in, and he started correlating that traffic enough to figure out where could this potentially be upstream from where we were. And we are end up able to end up figuring out how many network hops that was away consistently. And it narrowed us down to the networks we could get to to find the thing. And we finally mm -hmm. found it and got it off the network. Were those, those, were those like route advertisement packets? Yeah. Right OK. So it wasn't his traffic specifically. It was the route. No. What, yeah. He had, he had a split tunnel VPN configuration set up. Okay. Um, and he was basically bridging traffic between our network and his. And he was participating in the route advertisement or receivement of the routes on his side, picking them up and flooding them right back in, in on our side of the network. It was crazy. We picked up thousands of routes like instantaneous when that happened. It's hard to read that configuration on their end, though. It is. Okay. Yeah, we just ended up being the victim of it. And it, it took down our networks, right? It just flooded our route tables. Um, goofy things like that. Um, happen. So I alluded to this just a little bit, right? Here's a standard sequence, sequence with an acknowledgement and an acknowledgement. This is TCP, so this is connection oriented, which means we're going to do some kind of guarantee of service. So when this traffic takes place, you see this exchange taking place where, where the two systems are basically handshaking with each other. And um, this refers to, uh, again, the, the window size that's being advertised on both sides, each system. And here's that segment size number that I was talking about before. 
So based on the number of hops that we're walking through the network, um, this is the segment sizes that can actually be transmitted from point to point based on that communication taking place. Notice the length of these packets are all zero. Right, there's no data sitting in those. This is all just exchange that's taking place kind of at the protocol layer for TCP and IP. So these linked numbers, once this is established and that exchange is taking place, if you're actually moving data, you're going to see these uh, changing in size. They go back and forth. So I'll give you one example of where the zero windows scenario works really cool. And that's with a product that we run internally here, a VPN product called NetMotion. Um, and it's used a fair amount by law enforcement. That's the first place that I ran into the usage of this. But we've ended up deploying it on our field work devices where we've got crews out in the field um, running portable systems out there. The cool thing with that product is it has the ability of knowing um, when it has network coverage and when it doesn't. And it has the ability also to roam all over the place. So it can figure out that I'm on a public hotspot, it can figure out I'm on a cell connection, it can automatically transition to a wired connection. All it needs to know is that it can get to the internet. If it can get to the internet and find our edge gateway that's out on the network, it knows it can communicate. So it can automatically move back and forth between those environments without the, the client ever needing to know that. If you happen to go out of coverage with that system, especially in the case of where you have TCP traffic, right? This is connection oriented. In many cases, you'll find these applications, even when traffic isn't moving on the network, they'll have timers inside of them that are kind of like keep alives. And that can vary depending on the application. Some of them can run pretty aggressively on the network. You might have others that, hey, every five minutes, I'm just gonna send you a little message to let you know I'm still here. We're gonna, we're gonna do the handshake again with that. Apps will break when you don't have connectivity via VPN. What NetMotion does is when it knows that connectivity is gone, it takes the TCP portion of that traffic and it sends zero window messages into the application. So it basically is telling it that the peer that you're communicating with has no buffer space left to be able to communicate with me via TCP. And those apps will stay alive with that message. As soon as the client comes back into having communication again and it knows it's working properly, it will stop that <coughs> proxying and allow the window sizes to come back normal. Now the person using the application may still not be able to use it because the app needs to know it's in that state. So if I'm gonna enter data in, um, I, that stuff would have to be buffered and held in the system until the communication came back where it could actually send it. But if the person doesn't drive the application, if they can look at their screen and realize that they don't have connectivity and just leave it alone, they don't have to sign in again. And when you're, you know, you guys know in many cases you're running a half a dozen things on your desktop at a time anyway. And if the field guys that are in the field doing that don't have to re-log in, that's a really cool feature. But that's a place where, you, again, you could see some traffic associated with something like that. It's normal behavior. It's all about knowing the environment. Well, let's see. I think we've covered everything we need to there. Here's the TCP header. Um, again, sequence numbers that we've talked about here, window sizes we've discussed already being exchanged. Here's also the flag settings within a TCP heading. Have you guys ever heard of the, the you know, Christmas tree frames that you can send in? Do you have familiarity with what those are? It, it's marking all of these on. And so, you know, what those, those types of attacks in the past were to try to throw off the intermediate systems that are gonna be receiving that data. So if I can screw the protocol up enough that you're not coded to handle it correctly, I can find a way to trip that that product up, that listener up, and be able to gain access. One of the key ones in here, though, that under normal operation that I would tell you about, obviously the SIN, SIN bit is set when you're exchanging or setting up the connection. The, the PIN is set when you're going to tear the connection down. Um, sometimes reset gets used in that situation either. So 
If you look at a standard frame, there's a sin, sin, act, act in order to set up the communication. When you tear it down, generally there's a thin, act, a thin, and act. A lot of applications don't adhere to the breakdown, the, the teardown of the sessions that way. A, a lot of them will just send a reset, which basically says, I'm done. I'm not going to communicate with you anymore. So it's common you may see that, again, in a normal way. You may see that in an abnormal way, too, depending on how that gets used. I may be at a point where maybe at an application level I'm expecting to hear from you within a particular amount of time and you haven't communicated with me. So I'm assuming that it's done. So as a server, I'm just going to send you a message back and say, drop the connection, we're finished. You might see a reset in that kind of scenario. The push bit's the other one, though, that I'd like to talk about a little bit. And this one is kind of key when you get into application performance. So if that bit is turned on and I'm sending a frame into you, basically what I'm telling the stack is when the TCP, TCP stack receives that frame, I need for you to take this immediately and push it up into memory into that application. No delay, don't buffer it, don't do anything else with, with the frame other than deliver it and get it clean. A lot of apps use this. Um, what you will see though is, again, we talked about um, connection-oriented communication with TCP and sequence numbers and those acknowledgements. So if I'm sending, for example, if I have sequence number 100 and I'm sending 100 bytes of data to you, I'm expecting it to get an acknowledgement back with that sequence number being 200. Right? I'm going to increment that sequence number by the amount of data I'm sending to you um, every single time. And if I send that data in, I have the push bit set. As soon as the stack releases that data to go to the application, it's automatically going to initiate an acknowledgement coming back. So it's going to tell me that packet was processed, and it's going to increment that sequence number and send it back to me with an acknowledgement. In most cases with applications, even with the push bit set, Generally, there's always an exchange of data that's constantly going back and forth, right? I'm making a request into a server, I'm making a database call maybe, and I'm expecting to get data back. So when that acknowledgement comes back, I expect that I.O. has completed and I've got that data returning to me. What's a key indicator of performance issues on a, on a server is I send that data in with a, or that request in with a push bit set and I get an act back, and then six seconds later, the traffic ends up showing, the data ends up showing up. So you can look for those behaviors of that in a trace, and it will give you a good indication of where a performance issue is. And then 99% of the time, when you have that I I issue in your environment, where do you think the person that's having that issue thinks that problem is? It's yours, right? It's on the network, it's the firewall, it's the switch, it's you got to have that data available in order to, to do that. Um, in fact, BT was giving me a hard time <laughs> this last year because we had some developers here within the organization, and they swore to me I was blocking a connection that they had going outbound. And I got so tired of debating it with the guy, I actually ended up taking my laptop, going across the street, sitting down with him, tapped into his machine where he was at, and said, initiate your connection, right? And I showed him the three-way handshake, just something as basic as that, right? We're not talking about anything that's really involved. But I had to prove to him that this connection was occurring so he could try to go figure out how to troubleshoot the next issue was with it because it, it didn't have anything to do with his internet connection or the firewalls or anything else that we had going on. Here's the scaling option, too. I talked a little bit about that uh, in Windows today where you could multiply uh, the window size because the systems just have more capability. So again, we've talked about window size exchange, so retransmissions. Again, when I send, if I have connection-oriented traffic via TCP and I send a data packet to you, my stack is automatically going to start a timer. And I'm going to expect an acknowledgement back from you within a certain amount of time. If I don't get that acknowledgement, I'm going to resend that traffic again. And there are algorithms within TCP to determine the frequency and the back off that I may need to do when I'm doing retransmissions. 
Does anybody have an idea of how that timer gets set? It's in the initial handshake. So when the TCP send packets go back and forth across the network, it basically is looking at the round trip time of those when that occurs, and it determines that to be, here's the amount of latency in the network that I think may be normal. And so that's how I'm gonna establish what my timer should be within my system. Fast retransmits are just that, is as soon as that, that timer pops, I'm automatically gonna be sending that. Because the other scenario that could occur with this is that maybe I did miss a packet. So TCP against sequence numbers, right? Sequence numbers are coming cr across to me all the time with the amount of data I'm moving in, that fr in those frames. And those numbers need to be incrementing each time. If I end up with a packet that get lo gets lost in the network, um, I may have to, to send a message back to you to say that I, I need a retransmission of that. We've talked about zero window already. Performance indicators, again, if a system gets exhausted, I may send a zero window back. We've talked about the app already without a data response based on the push bit being set. That may be another indicator. So resources you can use in this environment. Wireshark.org, Laura Chappell's material. Chris Sanders is a really gr another really great guy uh, in this space. He's got a book that he published, uh, I think the year before last, that's out right now. Um, but he's also in the cyber community, does a lot of pen testing, and he's, he's really an awesome guy. Uh, connect with him. Network guy, I'm not 100% sure where he's at today. This is, um, this is a guy by the name of Scott Cogdall, and Scott was the chief uh, technology officer at Wild Packets for a while. Um, he's working, I think, for a company in, in the Twin Cities now. Uh, he also has a book out, though, um, that is, still has a lot of great information in it as well. But I don't know how, uh, I don't know how active he is in his, um, in his blog and stuff anymore. I can't get the screen back. Despite selecting it, it's still going back to one. Doesn't the space bar go poof or go fizzy at a time? Does it? I think so. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, 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 it's still taking the animation. <laughs> Okay. Um, Wild Packets uh, is is now a new company. They rebranded re themselves in some fashion, Davos, but they have. Um, they have this network glossary. If you go to the Learn tab off on their page, and this is down toward the bottom of that page, jump into this. So one of the guys I'll talk about here briefly that is doing Connect 802 today is a guy by the name of Joe Bardwell. And Joe was a chief engineer at Network General for many, many years. This guy knows networking inside and out. Um, at, at one point, he was named like one of the top most important people in, in the IT space. But he wrote a lot of this network glossary. And when he left that organization to start his own company here, they still had the rights to that. So it's sitting out there. Mm -hmm. Definitely leverage that material. It's really good. I talked a little bit about Pine Mountain Group uh, and Bill Alderson's team and how they were pulled into the Pentagon after the 9-11 attacks. Mike Panaki was one of the guys that was a part of that team too. He's still running his own consulting firm up in the Seattle area doing this work. So Joe Bardwell is headed off doing um, wireless work now. Um, if you're interested in the wireless space, definitely uh, look up the material Joe has. Joe also has started another kind of technical compendium like he did up here in this glossary for the wireless space as well. Um, 
I have drawn a complete blank on his name now. Josh Wright, sorry. Josh Wright's the other guy, Will Hack for Sushi, uh, that's done a lot of work in the wireless communication space. So if you're not familiar with him, uh, absolutely uh, check out some of his stuff that's out there as well. So publications for this, Scott Hogdahl's book that's out, Network Analysis and Troubleshooting, Chris Sanders is Practical Packet Analysis, Wireshark, there's numerous stuff out there uh, by Laura Chapel and Gerald Combs. On the TCP front, there's two different publications out there today. Um, Stevens has two books out, TCP Illustrated. There's two volumes. If you're into development work at all, these are definitely the books to get because he has a lot more development information in them. But for me, not being a coder historically, um, I, I really relied a lot on Doug Comer's book, uh, Internetworking with TCP, uh, TCP IP. That, that book was really the Bible for me. If I needed to reference anything relative to how these protocols work, your options are you can go to the RFCs and read them if you want, <laughs> or you, know, you can take a book like Comer's who can put that in context for you and give you a little bit of information around it as well as to how it really works. Um, He's also a great guy, a professor at, at Purdue. Um, he's, he's been in the industry for a long time. But I definitely would tell you, get one of these uh, and get it in your library of stuff if you're gonna, if you're gonna do this work. And so in closing, happy Festivus to everybody. I wanna be <laughs> politically correct here. Um, if you're not familiar with what Festivus is, Google it. <laughs> um, does anybody know the tenets of Festivus though? No? <laughs> Airing of grievances is the first thing you do. Anybody know the second one? No? Feats of strength. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have arm wrestling competitions. That's it. I'm out. Um, thanks for letting me go way over. Uh, questions? Comments? Do you ever see uh, the push flag used in an attack since it goes directly into memory? Sure. There's any, any, really, any of the, the um, portions of these frames can be manipulated in ways to try to uh, push the stack to behave in ways that, that we may not expect. Over the years, I think much of that has been addressed or, or attempted to be taken care of based on how this was used you know, years past, but you never know. There's, if you talk to guys that are doing pen testing today for a living, I mean, they'll tell you they're they're running into the same things all over again, right? It's we don't correct this stuff. It doesn't get any better. SQL injection is as bad as it's ever been. So when you look at, at things like this, where you can manipulate that frame header and you may still have a crappy stack on the machine, you may be able to, to manipulate it in some fashion. Other questions or comments? Does anybody have any comments around this work you've done around this that you want to share? All right, we're out. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our last formal MySec meeting of the year. Um, one other thing to mention that if you, uh, next year's speaker schedule is like completely open right now. So if you're interested in providing a topic or you want to do a lightning talk, let me know and I can put you on the list and start getting on it all organized together. Otherwise, see you later. <laughs>